Mark Schumann, thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, brother. I wanted to go way back and I uh, want you to tell me about your earliest musical memories. Oh, my earliest musical memory really is The Beatles on Ed Sullivan. I know a lot of people talk about that, but I was three. Standing there with my family, standing in front of the television, I saw John, Paul, and George, and I just freaked out. Then I saw Ringo, and I, something resonated deep inside of me. I, you know, I just saw like the, you know, that big, beautiful nose and the smile and the swishy hand. And then I saw all the screaming girls and I said, that's it. I want that. <laughs> and then uh, I want to play drums. And my mother said, no, can't you play a nice instrument like your brother Randy? He plays violin. Oy vey. So uh, I ended up playing cello. Yeah. So I grew up playing cello. And then I get a little drum lesson at the end of every cello lesson because my cello teacher was my godfather. And eventually my parents broke down and they could not deny me my passion and I got my first drum set at nine years old and that was it. And I give them so much credit because my room was next to theirs. So they endured, you know, I probably built, I probably had my, my 10,000 hours of Gladwell by the time I was 12, you know. Uh -huh. um, so do you, did you go through a music program at school? Actually not. I grew up playing in bands. Uh, I, I started, I played my first professional gig when I was 12. Played all through high school, bar mitzvahs, weddings, parties, actually made money. And then I, I studied a little bit with Henry Belson, a little bit with Mel Zelnick, who you wouldn't know. Henry Belson is Louis' brother. And then when I was 17, I started studying with Freddie Gruber for a couple of years. And then I, I've changed things around. And then I learned more about drumming when I started teaching at 19 years old. But I always played in bands. I also studied production, took some production classes. So I was always the one producing my bands. And I was always in studios and... So I just really mainly learned from uh, knowing how to read music from cello and then studying with Freddie and then just building it up from them. And then I went through a Zappa phase and got really into, you know, nested rhythms and seven over threes and, and all that stuff. So I kind of went through the gamut and I played in big bands and, and I played in orchestras. So I kind of, I learned through a lot of experience. Uh, was there a local music store that you frequented? Well, music stop was a store owned by Mel Zelnick, who was a big band drummer. That's where Henry Belson taught out of. And that's where Freddie Gruber originally taught out of in the 60s, I believe. And it was in Canoga Park, California. I'm an actual valley boy. Ha ha, born and raised in LA. One of the few entertainment professionals. So once you got into drums, who were the drummers that uh, inspired you? Everybody. But my big inspirations, obviously, Buddy Rich, Ringo, um, Floyd Sneed from Three Dog Night, Bobby Columbi from Blood, Sweat and Tears were big influences. And then um, I got into uh, you know, Picaro and I got into Gad and I got into Vinny and I really started listening to everybody. I love Jack DeJohnette. Um, got into listening to Tony Williams and Miles Davis and um, I always loved the pop bands as well. So I really have always been, consider myself a pop drummer, but I've also always been on the fringe and listened to a lot of crazy stuff. I got really into Zappa, as I said, for a while. Um, so I've, I've allowed, I allow every drummer to influence me. I believe that it's all about having big ears. And rather than closing myself off to somebody, you know, I was a snob when I was a kid. I didn't like Charlie Watts. I thought, ugh, Charlie Watts sucks. And then at one point, you know, I started giving a lot of drum clinics and I said, you know what, Charlie Watts is the greatest drummer in the world for the Rolling Stones. Imagine Dave Weckl on the Rolling Stones, it wouldn't work. So that's when I realized it's all about the chemistry and everybody has their own unique feel and you sit 10 drummers down and they all play There's gonna be minute differences in the way they feel and the way they approach, the way they make the drums sound, so everybody has value. So what were you doing just prior to joining Pink's band? Just prior to joining Pink, let's see, I joined Pink 13 years ago, which would make it, oh, I was playing with Foreigner, off and on. Played with Foreigner, off and on, I played with Cher. So Pink and Cher are, are managed by the same management company. And I also did a stint with Velvet Revolver. Actually, right before Pink, I spent the summer with Velvet Revolver in 2005 because Matt Sorum had broke his hand and I played Ozfest. Um, and I was playing with some very big Japanese artists, a very big German artist, Udo Lindenberg, uh, one of the biggest Japanese artists, uh, two Japanese artists, Himuro, and then uh, Akichi Yazawa, who is like the biggest Japanese artist of all time. And I was still playing with uh, Billy Idol. And I stopped playing with Billy Idol in 2001. I was playing with Stevie Nicks, 2001 to 2002. Going back and forth with Cher. I played, then I played with um, Simple Minds, um, and I did 
the record good news from the next world and did the tour in 2005. So I was going back and forth. To, I'm very fortunate. I play with a lot of amazing people. Yeah. Um, and just prior to Pink, I don't exactly remember what I was doing, yeah. but I was playing, always doing something. So Foreigner, Cher, uh, these are all very different uh, musical acts. Yes. Uh, so you have to be a versatile drummer. Where does that versatility come from? Versatility comes from really loving all these different styles of music and being able to draw from all the influences. And I remember when I got the Foreigner gig, when I auditioned, you know, Mick Jones said, you know, you, you have the feel of a, of a funk drummer, but you hit like a rock drummer. And I thought that was an extraordinary compliment. But I like to think of myself as having the role and the understanding of ghost notes and just that feel and that space and the groove of having, you know, my first road gig was with Brenda Russell, an R&B artist, then I played with uh, uh, Jeff Lorber Fusion, and I played. I did a lot of uh, smooth jazz gigs and R&B gigs, and then I kind of, and Bobby Caldwell, then I moved into the rock element after that. So I kind of always really loved funk and groove music, and I loved the Beatles, so I could sort of take it, and then at a point I really worked on, you know, getting my, uh, my uh, trajectory up higher and really giving bigger energy so I, I, I took the old sort of acting me methodology of playing to the person in the back row and I still do like when I I look at an audience I look at everybody and I look at everybody in back everybody in front I'm not just staring at the people in front because I realize my gig is to really be able to put that energy out and hit the person in the back row so they are not only hearing it they're seeing it and they're feeling it. They get that kinetic feeling. Uh, you're not uh, only a musician, performer, uh, producer. You're also an educator. What's the number one thing that you try to get across to people that you're speaking to? Well, I do a lot of high-end corporate speaking gigs. I call myself an activational speaker, not a motivational speaker, because anybody that's on stage needs to be motivating. That's just part of it. I motivate people to take action, and it's my new speech is based on this philosophy created by Dr. Jim Samuels, who's the co-writer of my second book, which is all about the power of attitude. Everything we do begins with attitude, and what, we, what I sort of realize is that, you know, we can't control what happens to us, but we always have the power to control our attitudes about what happens to us. And I talk about shifting our attitudes because our attitudes are where we're looking from. It's our point of view. And that gives us enormous power to know that consciously we can actually shift this because our attitudes are what drive our behaviors and one attitude can drive many behaviors and our behaviors are what determine the consequences of our lives. So everything we do begins with attitude. And if you want to reverse engineer it, you look at the consequence you want to create, the outcome you want to create, you get very specific about it. Think about what kind of behavior you would need to cultivate and generate to create that out, that that output, that consequence, and then look and see what is the attitude that I'm going to need to sustain to drive that behavior, to drive that consequence. And you apply this to anything in your life, I guarantee you, you will improve your performance and you will realize that you actually have more control over your consequences than you believe. Yeah, that's a very handy way of thinking for musicians because musicians are on the road and uh, they get tired yep. um, and the performance level is up and down and uh, they're feeling happy one day and sad the next. Yeah. So as a it musician... Happens. We're human. It happens. Yeah. But what I, what I, my inherent belief system is that every single note that I play matters. Every nuance, every space, every combination of rhythms matters. Because if every note matters, I'm driving that every note with purpose. And the moment I attach purpose to every note, I become more passionate about every note. I mean, I played So What by Pink 800 times. The 800th time is just as pur purposeful and passionate as the first time, because that's the way I treat it. When I get on stage, I take every nuance very, very seriously, but lovingly and joyfully and playfully. And that's how I can keep on doing it. Yeah. I'll never forget one day, I, 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 you know, I was out with Foreigner off and on for many years, and we were in the middle of a big tour, and I was sitting there thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna go out and play. Feels like the first time, hundreds of times. It's like God's big joke, right? And then a couple days later, I went on stage and I realized, wait a minute. I looked at that audience and I realized, you know, for them, it really is their first time. So how dare I have a negative attitude 
and deprive them of that first time experience when I could just attach purpose and passion to every note and recreate the first time experience and everybody wins. So that's how I approach my playing and that's why after 31 years, I'm still playing with world-class artists. I'm playing with the coolest female artists on the planet. You mentioned so what? Uh, tell me about the recording session for that and your drum parts. I didn't record anything. Are you, you, Everything's programmed. Okay. On her records. What's beautiful about being a part of this band and being a part of her world is, certainly from my standpoint, I played on a couple of things that didn't make it on the record, but 99.9% .9 of the, the music is programmed drums and not even a lot of guitar stuff necessarily. Then we get the Pro Tools stems live and then we evolve into what we play live and I put real drum parts, Justin puts these blazing guitar parts on, we all add our own nuances and we evolve the songs. And we love that and she loves that. I'll never forget when we were rehearsing for the last tour, uh, the manager said, you know, she says she wants things to stick a lot, you know, to the record. So um, that song, What About Us? You know, the drum part is that's it, right? So he said, you know, learn it just like the record. And then we had already learned it like owning it. I was playing all these Tom things and Justin was really playing the guitars really heavy. So she comes in and first we play it like the record. And you're looking at her going, oh, yeah, she's like, okay. And I actually stood up at the drum set. I said, we have another version where we actually have, you know, put, put more of ourselves, you know, humanized it more. The drums are bigger, the guitars are crunchier. We play that for her and she's like, yeah, that's it. So she loves the evolution live because when you're playing live, it isn't about just recreating the exact record. It's about evolving the music and moving the audience to another level. And she loves that and we love that and everybody wins. Yeah. Well, what's the best thing about being in Pink's band? Pink. <laughs> She's incredible because she sets the bar so high there is not a greater performer on the planet and she's one of the greatest singers on the planet. So you combine those two, those are, I, I, I'm so, I feel so, so much gratitude every time I'm on stage with this woman and she's really cool, she's really good to people. She's feisty and she's biting but she's great to everybody and she's an inspiration so she drives us. I mean she can die doing what she does. I'm just sitting there playing drums. I'm safe. I'm on the ground. So I'm humbled by her. Yeah. And the musicians are incredible and they're also some of my best friends. Eva the bass player, Justin on guitar, Jason on keys, Jesse on violin, Adrian on the second keyboards, and then Jenny and Stacy singing. I mean, these people are the best of the best. So what could be better? Yeah. Uh, Pink was very generous uh, to Australia recently and, and made I a know. huge donation to the, the Bush Because she's time. generous. Yeah. yeah. Did it surprise you, the amount? Or a half a million? Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah. I mean, we, we are so <laughs> attached to Australia. I've spent probably a year and a half of my life in Australia. Not to mention some of my best friends live there. My daughter, who's only nine years old, her Australian friend lived here and moved away three years ago. She still calls her best friend. And they get together and it's like they are still best friends. We have such a strong connection with Australia, it's uncanny. And I understand why the Aussies like Pink so much. Because the Aussies are very straightforward, no BS, tell it like it is. That's exactly the way that she is. And so I think she immediately resonated with the Aussies. And that's why I love the Aussies, because I'm the same way. It's like, this is how it is, and we just have so much fun. And I, I love Australia. I think it's gorgeous. The people are incredible. I love your accent, right? And... Uh, we really do have a, a, the strongest connection with that country, and she always has. Yeah. Tell me about some of the relationships with the gear companies you've had over the years. Ah, uh, well, I started out, um, I've endorsed, I think, four or five drums companies. Um, I landed with Gretsch back in 2002 because I realized that when I was on the road a lot, and I'd get called to do sessions, I would just come on my, and I would just literally tell them, say, you bring in any drum set you want. Because I, I wanted the producers and engineers to be happy. And 80, 85% of the time was a Gretsch kit. And they always sounded great, they always sounded perfect. And after a while I kind of thought, you know, these really are 
the coolest drum. So why waste my time anymore with anybody else? And I finally got with Gretchen 2002, and it's like, it's like family. It feels like home. Sabian, I've endorsed Sabian cymbals since 1988. It's a long time. It's 32 years. I originally started playing Sabians because they sounded like Zildjian's and they were cheaper. <laughs> and then I just fell in love with the sound. And Vic Firth sticks I came back to, Remo heads I came back to, and of course Roland Electronics, the only electronics in the Gibraltar hardware, and I use uh, these symbol, symbol, uh, symbol attachers that keep the symbols really uh, taut. You know, my feeling about gear is, it's like food, or it's like your girlfriend or boyfriend or mate or something, you know? We're just attracted to different things. And when I sit down in a, a Gretsch kit and I, and I play four different lines of Gretsch, you know, the Renown, Broadcaster, Brooklyn, of course, USA, Ma uh, Maple. Um, they are all brilliant. They all have their own sound. But they feel really comfortable. Like the space between the rims and the drum and, and the heads. Vic Firth sticks just feel like home. I've tried other sticks. I came back. Remo heads, same thing. Tried every head company and came back. Sabian, I just always play from the start. Because they've always been symbols I've loved. So my belief is like... I can tell you, you know, like my favorite food's Mexican. My wife's least favorite food is Mexican. So I can try to talk her into Mexican all I want, but she's a real foodie and she likes French food and Italian food. I like that food too, of course. But you know, gear is a very personal thing. And so you need to play what you want. So I play the gear that resonates with me the most. And I even had my own snare drum with Gretsch and that was literally born um, organically out of the fact I was doing so many clinics and I was using satellite snare drums and I was having a discussion with John Palmer who was the, you know, uh, one of the, he was like the marketing manager and one of the designers at the time, and I said, you know, you guys need a drum that does this and this and this and sounds like this. At the end of the conversation, he said, we'll make it the Mark Shulman signature drum. I didn't get rich. I didn't do it to do that. Uh, I didn't do it for that reason. I just thought, oh, this would be a great drum to have in the line. So it really is just your connection with the instrument and the gear because it's your expression. And that's the way I look at gear. So I never tell people, oh, play gear because I play it. Play gear because you've really checked out all the gear and you know that this is what you like or this is what you love and this feels right to you. What does music mean to you? Everything. <laughs> I mean, I was born a musician. I mean, when I, ever since I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, I sat at a drum set when I was five, I could play. I knew what to do. I wasn't a prodigy necessarily, but music chose me. Drums chose me. I didn't choose drums or music. I also studied harmony. I can pick harmonies out. I can harmonize with, with anything. I, I just, you know, when, it, when it's so, it's just in your blood. It's either in your blood or it's not. I mean, it's in most people's blood, but I never forget I had a girlfriend whose dad said, oh, I don't like music. And I was gobsmacked. I'm like, what? That's like saying I don't like air, you know? <laughs> so for me, it just gets, I mean, music is infinite. And I have, and, and I listen to every different kind of music from Brazilian to, I love that new kid, Jacob Collier, who's like the evolution of music. He's just brilliant to like my old 70s and 80s hits to like Miles Davis to Buddy Rich's big band to Vinny's craziest stuff he's ever done um, to the Beatles. And I love it all. And I listen to my daughter's little pop hits that she likes to play. You know, she likes Dove Cameron, and she likes uh, uh, any, any of the new female artists. And so I listen, and, I, and I, my idea about music is you try to find what you like, as opposed to what you don't like. If you find what you like, you learn from it, and you take it in, and you can always find something cool. If you immediately reject something, I'm like, I'm not the biggest rap fan in the world, but I've listened to some of the rappers and I just think like the phrasing is amazing and I find what I like and I compare it to like thinking about Buddy Rich when he was tap dancing and just the little, you know, the, the, the rhythms you can create with your mouth. And so that music is, is, it is literally a universal force. It is one of the most powerful forces on the planet and it can literally move mountains. It can take a, you know, 100,000 people or, you know, with Simple Minds, I played Glastonbury Festival, 225,000 people. Imagine 225,000 people all grooving to the same song. That amount of energy could, could power a city, <laughs> you know? Yeah. What are you most proud of? The fact that I've been able to do what I love and make a living at it 
and I'm just so joyful that I have co-created with God and the universe and circumstances and luck and being fortunate, but I've done a lot of work and I managed to work steadily. And of course my daughter, <laughs> I have a nine year old daughter and she's just, you know, I'm, I'm an older dad. She was born when I was in my forties and I'm so proud of her. I'm so proud of the fact that I can be a parent and I'm so proud of the fact that I, that I get to experience that because I didn't, I had cancer when I was younger and I wasn't supposed to be able to father a child myself. And so I wrote it off and I shifted my attitude about it. Met my wife, Lisa, and Lisa was like, darn, just completely set on the fact that we were gonna have a child together. And, you know, a little bit of great timing, you know, a little help from, you know, the doctors and, and, and the universe, and bam, she got pregnant, and Zay was born in, in 2010, and I'm really proud of that kid. She's just a good soul. She's an old soul, and she's smart. She's got, you know, she's got a red belt in martial arts, but she's kind and she's compassionate, and that's what matters the most. Mark Schumann, thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Great questions. Happy to be of service.